Hi everybody, welcome to your cell unit video notes. We're gonna start out by doing just a quick review of the types of cells. So when it comes to cells, there's two types that we're gonna focus on in this class, and that's prokaryotes and eukaryotes. What you need to know is just a basic difference between the two. So prokaryotes are going to be your small, simple cells. They don't have any organelles or a nucleus. They do have DNA, however. And these are things like bacteria. Eukaryotes are more complex, they're larger, they have all those fun organelles you probably learned in middle school, and things like plants, animals, fungi, they all have eukaryotic cells. So here's a quick glance at what a prokaryotic cell looks like, and then at this point I would pause the video and go ahead and just sketch the cell out and please label the parts as well. This is something you will be responsible for knowing later on in this unit. Here then is a look at a typical plant and a typical animal cell. So when we look at the two, the biggest difference we notice is that the plant cell is much more rigid in structure. That's because of the cell wall that plants have. This cell wall is going to give plants their shape and then plants don't move, they don't need to be as flexible, but you also see a lot of organelles that overlap. We'll spend some time in class going through the different organelles, but this is just giving you kind of a quick glimpse of what they look like. Speaking of organelles, here are some of the basic ones you should have a pretty good understanding of their functions of. So things like a mitochondria, a vacuole, chloroplast, cell wall, nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum or ER, and remember that's rough and smooth, Golgi and ribosomes, and also the cell membrane. So we're going to get a little more into the cell membrane now moving forward. First, you should know the cell membrane is known by several other names, things like plasma membrane, phospholipid bilayer, and the fluid mosaic model. The membrane itself is also selectively permeable. So what does that mean? It means it's choosy about what moves in and out of the cell. So it allows things like nutrients into the cell and then things like waste out of the cell. Let's break down that name then a little bit further. So the name itself, phospholipid bilayer. So phospho is a phosphate head. This is the hydrophilic or water loving portion of the cell membrane. Then we have lipid and these are lipid tails and they're hydrophobic. So phobic, a phobia, they fear water. Excuse my cursive, but fear water. And the, the head and the tail looks like this. It has two little tails coming down out of it. And then bilayer simply just means that there's two layers sandwiched. So because the tails are hydrophobic, they want to face each other. So the cell membrane is a bunch of these all in a line with the tails facing each other and the water loving parts of the membrane face out. So let's talk then a little bit more about the other term, fluid mosaic model. Well, when you hear the word mosaic, you may think of something like this, lots of different colors and pretty stones all put together. Well, the cell membrane is a very similar approach because there's many molecules that are floating in this membrane. So if we look at this picture here, you see things like proteins, carbohydrates, you see cholesterol, you see all the heads and tails. So all of these things make up almost like a mosaic of the cell membrane. What are they? Like we just talked about, proteins, cholesterol, carbohydrates are the three main things we're gonna focus on on these next few slides. First up then, the proteins. There are five different proteins that I need you to be aware of that exist in the cell membrane, and we'll go through each of these. So a glycoprotein has carbohydrates attached to it, kind of like an antenna out the top. The integral protein goes through the cell membrane. It's gonna go from the top to the bottom of the cell membrane. Whereas the peripheral is on the outside edges or the borders. Think about your peripheral vision is like the edges. Same thing with a peripheral protein. A channel protein allows substances through. Think about maybe like a channel on a lake or like the Panama Canal, for example. That's going to allow something from one side to the other. And then a carrier protein, it opens at the top to take something in, closes, and opens at the bottom. So it always kind of reminds me a little bit of like a Pac-Man. Then when we look at this picture, you can see these different proteins. So here's your glycoprotein. Here's your channel protein. Here's an integral protein, 
and a peripheral protein. So some of those functions of those proteins, the glycoproteins and the peripheral proteins, so here and here, are going to help with signals. If you look at the glycoprotein, I'm sorry, that's not integral. Peripheral, excuse me. So if you look at the glycoprotein, it has like a little antenna almost coming out the top, right? Structurally, the integral and peripheral are also going to help with structure because they're located throughout the membrane. And then of course, transport, your channel and carrier proteins are helping substances move through from one side of the other of the cell membrane. Cholesterol is also an important part of the cell membrane, and this is a lipid, so think back to macromolecules. So a lipid is cholesterol, and it can actually be almost up to 50% of the membrane in some cells. So this does also provide support, but more importantly, the function I want you to focus on is that it prevents those fatty acid tails from sticking together. So if you have long hair, for example, you know it because sometimes you get some knots, you need to like comb through it. Think about cholesterol almost as like your conditioner. It's what you're putting to make sure those tails don't all stick together. Carbohydrates are the third major thing you need to be aware of in the cell membrane, and these help identify chemical signals. So they're either going to be attached to a protein, like here, or just the little phospholipid, the little head. So either one, though, they're going to help with signaling, no matter what. All right, so we've learned about the cell membrane. Now it's time to get into transport and how that happens across the membrane. So there are two kinds, passive, and active, passive, diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis are the three that you'll know for that. And then active with transport proteins and then endocytosis and exocytosis. All right, let's get into passive transport a little deeper then. The most important thing you need to understand is this first box here. Passive transport is when things move from a high to low concentration gradient, or you may see the term with the concentration gradient. This requires no energy, and the cells are working towards equilibrium or having the same amounts on both sides. So the three types then are diffusion, which moves lipids and gases through the membrane. And diffusion too is almost like if someone sprays like some body spray or puts on some really smelly hand sanitizer or something like that, eventually if you're on the other side of the room, you're gonna smell it. So that's an example of diffusion. Facilitated diffusion does use channel proteins, but it's different from active transport and that it's still moving from high to low or trying to equal out those different concentrations. And then osmosis, super important, is the movement of water. So let's quiz time, right? So pause the video here and number a one, two, three in your notes and label what these are. All right, let's review. Number one, you should have chosen facilitated diffusion. It's using a protein. Number two, those are gases, so two is diffusion. And number three is showing water. So water's moving in and out of red blood cells, so that's osmosis. All right, a little bit more about osmosis. So we will spend probably the most time talking about osmosis of all the transports. So within osmosis, there's different types of solutions. There's hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic. So a couple tricks. Hypotonic is when water's moving into the cells. So you see here, hypotonic and animal cells at the top and a plant cells at the bottom. The hypotonic is not good for animal cells. They're going to burst because they don't have a cell wall. But plant cells, they like being hypotonic because this helps their plants stay upright. So if you've ever seen a wilted plant, its cells are not hypotonic. They're in the isotonic or hypertonic situation. And a good way to think about this is hypo, think hippo. Hippos are big and round, so a hypotonic solution is going to result in cells that are big and round. Isotonic is equal, and it's really important that you note that water is still moving. It's just moving in and out. So people commonly mix this up and think, oh, it's isotonic, everything's equal, there's no movement. There still is water movement, so that's really important to remember. And if you notice, blood cells or animal cells, they like to be isotonic. And then hypertonic is our last one. This is where water is moving out of the cells, and they're actually shriveling. So if you look here, the plant cell, it still has that square structure because of the cell wall, 
But if you notice, the green is kind of pulling away from the cell wall because it's shriveling. And this is not ideal for either cell. Cells do not want to be hypertonic. So now that we've talked about passive transport, let's talk about active transport. So active is essentially the opposite of passive. So instead of moving from high to low, we're moving from low to high or against the concentration gradient. This is like swimming upstream or biking up a hill. This takes energy to do. And there's three types. So we have transport proteins, which is similar to passive, except this time it's against the concentration gradient. And then we have two new terms, endocytosis and exocytosis. These prefixes should be familiar to you from learning about reactions, so endothermic and exothermic reactions. So endo means in. This is where a cell is engulfing something. It's taking something in. And there's two types. There's phagocytosis and pinocytosis. One is food, one is water. Exocytosis, then, is exit or out. So this is how the cell is removing things from itself, such as waste or other materials it doesn't want anymore. All right, quiz time again. So again, number one, two, three, and pause the video and write down which type of active transport you think each of these pictures is. All right, ready to review your results? Number one is exocytosis. If you notice, it's moving up and it's exiting the cell membrane. Number two, you should recognize the transport proteins. And then number three, it's engulfing or taking that particle in. So that's endocytosis. All right, we are going to stop there for this set of notes.